I'm going to try to grab the screen here. You guys see that OK? Yeah, we see it. Yep. OK. <clears throat> Awesome, thank you. So I'm kind of blind other than my presentation here. So Greg, if there's a comment or a question, let me know. Um, otherwise, yeah, thanks everyone for coming to this uh, presentation. Um, this is something Greg and I've been working on for a little while now in the plant materials program in general. But we wanted to talk about this idea of succession management, especially with regards to uh, the Cheatgrass Challenge program that NRCS and its partners have been involved with. Um, this may be kind of a for some of you, um, but hopefully by the end of the presentation, it, it seems like not such a, a, a difficult step in our planning process. Let's see. There we go. So uh, Greg informed me that we did have quite a few folks on that might not be familiar with NRCS. So I, I do have a couple of slides here um, to give a little background of our agency. So NRCS was started back in the 30s in response to the Dust Bowl, um, which most of you, are, I'm sure, are aware of. And our job is to improve, protect, and conserve natural resources on private lands, like Greg said, through cooperative partnerships and with state and local agencies. Um, we've had a little bit of evolution in the agency over time. In 1994, we changed to NRCS from SCS, and we've got somewhere around 11,000 employees today. And most of the agency is public facing and works with those private landowners, but we do have the plant materials program, which is kind of uh, the research branch of the of the agency. And our job in plant materials is to develop plants and plant science technologies to help with those conservation practices and the conservation efforts. And there's 27 PMCs nationwide. There's actually 20 that are run by uh, state conservation districts. And you can see there on the map, um, I'm located in Aberdeen in Southeast Idaho, and our service area covers a big portion of the Great Basin um, and a lot of the semi-arid west. And so here's that service area broken out into major land resource areas and our areas of focus right now are rangeland and forest lands, um, improving wildlife habitat and a lot of the, the driver for that is things like sage grouse and other at risk uh, species. We've done quite a lot of riparian and wetland work and we're doing more and more work in the realm of soil health on ag lands right now. And to address those issues, um, most of what we do is develop plant releases and then we do seed and plant production of those releases and we develop technologies to go along with those plants um, to help solve these resource problems and then we try to transfer that technology and educate people in what we have learned so this is going to be the heart of the the conversation now i want to talk about weeds and hopefully most of the people in the audience have seen this book it's in my opinion one of the most widespread books in the country um, it's given away as door prizes. It, you know, props up old rusty computers. It's we've got at least three copies here and there's 10 or so editions of it. And so, you know, the book contains about 300 different species of of what they're calling weeds. And I just want to ask, what does it take to, to get listed in this book? And so if you if you go in the book, they they're using a pretty liberal definition of weed. It's a plant that interferes with management objectives for a given area of land at a given point of time. And if you look at the picture there, um, you know, the classic example is like a rose bush in a cornfield. And here we've got some. Is that a question or does someone need to mute? I think gonna, they just muted. OK, perfect. So here you see some oriental poppy in a wheat field. So 
like I said, it's a it's a very liberal definition of, of the term weed. It's anything that isn't where you want it to be or any plant where you don't want it to be. And so if we go into the book, we're going to see some very interesting weeds. So here's one of the, the most pernicious weeds, I think. This is sagebrush. Um, you know, one of the most important and iconic species of the West, and it's right there in Weeds of the West. And so you've got to ask what management objective is this impeding? And, you know, I think the obvious answer is um, livestock production. A lot of the people in, in the NRCS and other agencies spent their careers trying to eradicate or lessen the presence of sagebrush on the landscape and replace it with forage grasses. And so I think that's how this ended up in Weeds of the West. Um, here's some more. These are milkweed species. Um, you probably know this is the host plant for the monarch butterfly, which is has been deemed worthy of listing as an endangered species under the Endangered Species Act. But, you know, several milkweed species are in Weeds of the West. Here's another one, rabbit brush. Again, a very important and prominent species on our rangelands. Um, and I'm going to assume it's in weeds of the West because it's not very great forage, not very palatable, and it increases under. This one might be new to, to some of you. This is Verbena bracteata or big bract vervain. Um, and I honestly couldn't tell you what management objective this is getting in the way of. And here's one of my favorite species. This is curly cup gumweed. Uh, again, probably um, a weed in cattle grazing situations. It's not palatable. Um, but more often than not, I think it's a sign of uh, improper grazing management rather than um, an actual weed. So that's just a few things, and, and everything I just showed was a native species. And if you go through Weeds of the West and do a tally, you'll come up with these figures here. 114 natives, 175 introduced species, and eight species that I consider to be both native or introduced, depending on where on the in the West you are. So 38% of that book is native species to our region. And so the next question is, what are the implications of misbranding all of these quote unquote native weeds? Um, and I'll, I'll mention that a lot of those species we just saw, because they're in weeds of the West, are actually crews or by canal district operators. Um, like gumweed I've seen listed in six counties of Wyoming as a weed that needs to be controlled or treated. And I think a lot of a lot of management decisions based on these native weeds is, is simply because they're in weeds of the West. And, and in many cases, people don't even realize they're native and have beneficial aspects. And so on the, the picture on the left, you see, you know, a, a set of wrenches and one of them's missing. And, and that's going to be my main point here is a lot of these native weeds are, you know, a tool that we could be using in rangeland restoration and rehabilitation that we're failing to use at the moment because we're seeing them as weeds and not as natives. So real quick, I just wanted to give kind of a background on the challenges we're facing in our rangelands. Um, especially as it has to do with the Cheatgrass Challenge program. So here's just a list of disturbances in the Intermountain West. We start with unnatural grazing timing and intensity, and I think this is really at the root of most of the problems we see today. Um, and this is 100 years of improper grazing or at least unnatural grazing that the system was not evolved with. And so if you add, if you use that pressure and it um, lessens the resiliency of the nation, you open yourself to invasion by things like cheatgrass, ventanata, and medusa head. And there's many others, but I think those are the, the top three right now. 
And then we have a history of replacing native plant communities with perennial forage grasses like crested wheatgrass, Siberian wheatgrass, um, Russian wild rye, and things like that. And again, this reduces the resilience of the local, local ecosystem. And as a result of all of those things, we're starting to see these mega fires that are in the thousands of acres and much more frequent now than they ever were in the past. Um, in NRCS, one of the, the main disturbances we have to deal with is agriculture, where on you know private land that has been in agriculture for many, many years, it's our job to come in and try to restore that ag field into some kind of a, a native or natural plant community. And then over the top of all of those, we'll add climate change to the list that's changing the temperature and precipitation patterns, um, both amount and um, timing of precipitation. And all of these things affect the natural cycles and, and processes on the landscape. And this is not just the plant community, but also think of the wildlife community and the underground soil, flora, and fauna as well. And our job as restorationists or, or land managers is to address all of these problems with some type of quote unquote restoration. And restoration means different things to different people or different groups. Um, it all depends on what the overall goal is going to be. And so, you know, NRCS and private landowners may have a very different goal from, say, na uh, National Park Service. The local plant community as closely as possible to pre-disturbance levels as they can with local um, genotypes. Um, you know, BLM might be a little bit more interested in forage and production. And Forest Service might be somewhere in the, in the middle ground. And then we've got external groups like the National Seed Strategy, uh, which is a partnership of, of people trying to promote natives. A uh, similar thing with the National uh, Academy of Science Native Plant Group, where they're promoting again natives and local germplasms for restoration. And and all of these groups in the Intermountain West, you know, we've we've got pretty low success rates. And those are just some numbers I've heard that's not backed up by data, but I think those are, you know, fairly accurate and, and good enough for discussion. And then with that image on the right, that's from Dobson et al. And I just wanted to get across the point again that there's several, several goals that one can, can try to reach with restoration or reclamation and several places where restoration stream or flow. Um, so we might try for an actual restoration of, you know, species by species, plant by plant almost on small scale sites. Uh, we might be more um, concerned with reclamation um, or rehabilitation, depending again on the goal. And so what do we what do we normally see and, and what can we learn from nature? So if you look at the top here of this chart, I've got um, plant community succession. So if we start here on the left with some type of disturbance, and that could be agriculture, or a large wildfire or could be cheatgrass invasion. Um, you know, in nature, we go through a series of steps that we call succession um, and very generalized here. It's going to go from early mid to a late or a climax community and, and, and I'll go more into this in, in later slides, but you see a different plant community fill each of these steps or phases. Now, often what we see is a disturbance and that leads to an explosion of the weed presence and that just perpetuates through time without any treatment. Um, those weeds are very well adapted at perpetuating their own existence. Now, if you go down to the bottom where we try some kind of treatment, often what we do or attempt to do is skip all the successional stages and go straight to the climax community. 
But what happens more often than not is we try our treatment and we fail and it goes right back to this disturbance step and we either treat it again or it goes into this weed pattern. And so we want to see what we might be able to do here with succession management to change this. And that's what I want to talk about. So again, here's natural restoration or plant community succession. So we've got a wildfire here on the left. The first thing that we often see in the Intermountain West is a bunch of little annual it's called slender flocks. There's also a species called um, blue-eyed Mary. Um, you see things like coyote tobacco. Um, but these are our colonizers, our pioneer species, and they stay in for a year or two, grab the soil, um, and they're doing stuff underground too, changing soil dynamics. And then over time, this stage transitions into kind of what's represented here, which is larger annual species, um, short-lived perennials and biennials. Um, you'll see things like gumweed and sunflower, sand drop seed and some other things. And then that transitions out after a couple of years to kind of the sagebrush step that we're mostly interested in and striving for. Um, if you keep going in this direction for a long period of time, you might actually transition to a fourth group, which would be that pinion juniper community. And then sometime down the road, you get another fire, right? And let's look at some other aspects of what's going on there. So this is the soil chemistry and biology, or at least a part of it with plant or plant succession. So on the on the X axis, I've got the plant community. So here's um, stable PNC, which is another way to say climax, some kind of disturbance right here. And then we transition through these serial stages again or um, successional stages. And on the y-axis, we're looking at mineralized nitrogen. So in a regular stable plant community, nitrate levels are somewhere in this region. They're fairly low in the Intermountain West. And then, and we'll, we'll look at this red line now, at, at the time of disturbance, you know, you kill all, let's say a wildfire, you kill all the above ground plants, and then the roots decompose, releasing nitrogen into the system and the nitrates spike right here. And then each one of these successional stages of plants um, reduces and immobilizes the nitrates and, and it just goes down and down steadily until you reach this level here where the climax community can establish again. And again, one of the things I think we're doing that, that may not be helping us is trying to shoot for this stable plant community when nitrates are very, very high. Now, what I don't show here and what might be interesting is that in a cheatgrass dominated system, those nitrates are steadily way up, way up here because the cheatgrass is producing a lot of biomass and then dying every year. Levels remain high. And so one thing we can do with plant succession is lower those levels. Here's another aspect of it, and I, th I think a lot of us are starting to get the hang of this idea that increased um, plant diversity increases resilience. And we've got this image here from Sage Grouse Initiative um, that I think depicts this very well. So you can see you've got some kind of little forb here. I'm not exactly sure what that is, a gilia or something. Uh, we've got a couple of perennial grasses. We've got some smaller perennial grasses like Sandberg bluegrass, and we've got uh, sagebrush here, and here's a lupin. So the more plant species you have on the landscape, the more niches you fill. And again, this is above ground and below ground. We've got similar things going on in the root systems. And the more of these niches we fill, the, the less opportunity there is for invasion. But let's think about what Doc Brown said on Back to the Future. We have to think fourth dimensionally. And so in this graph, we've got um, time again, and here's disturbance on the left and time moves on. And on the y-axis, 
we've got some kind of abundance of these different serial stages, late serial, mid and early, and then some perception of resilience again on the Y axis. So when we plant a late serial seed mix for restoration, we've got this lag time here of low abundance and low resilience waiting for that plant community to get fully established. Now in nature, this lag time is filled with the early successional group and the mid successional group, and that provides in time or um, resilience via temporal diversity. Um, and so I think we want to include these groups in our restoration thoughts and planning, you know, because this is when our failures happen is in this lag time. This is when cheatgrass takes over in our planting before our seed mix can really uh, take control of the site. And so we're starting to get a, a pretty good accumulation of, of scientific information in the literature showing that these early serial species can reduce invasive. So I'm just going to go through these quickly. Uh, fiddle neck has been shown to reduce cheatgrass biomass. And most of these studies are are in the greenhouse. You know, it's it's a pot, a small pot with one fiddle neck and one cheatgrass. And you compare that to um, a, another pot where there's two cheatgrass plants in it. And so if you add that fiddle neck to it, it reduces the cheatgrass biomass. Another study showed uh, Western tansy mustard reduced cheatgrass seed production by almost 80 percent. Um, and common sunflower reduced biomass of cheatgrass, white top and Canada thistle. And then in a slightly larger study, plot seeded with early cereal species reduced weed cover compared to plots seeded with our typical late successional um, seed mix. So we're starting to get some really good data and learning which species um, can be beneficial in this application. So what role does succession play in restoration planning and application currently? Well, I would I would say not much. So this slide shows some some data tables from our ESDs, our ecological site descriptions. And to me, when we're making a seed mix, this is kind of like the first place to go. I think, you know, nine times out of 10 when we're called to do a restoration mix or some kind of plan. Um, most of us have never been on the site before. We don't have an intimate knowledge of what the pre disturbance plant community was or what the potential is. And so we go to these ESDs, and this one is from a loamy 12 to 16 inch precip zone with uh, mountain sagebrush, Idaho fescue, and blue bunch wheatgrass. And if we just scroll through these tables, <laughs> and sorry about the codes here, um, you'll see in the grasses, the the dominant species are going to be Idaho fescue and blue bunch wheatgrass, you know, 15 to 25 percent of the composition and they make most of the productivity of the site. Um, you know, there's a smattering of different forbs at various levels of productivity and composition, but nothing really jumps out as being dominant here and shrubs. Obviously, the, the sagebrush is the dominant one. And there's a couple other things, but the, the point is nowhere in this list does it talk about succession or the dis different successional stages? So a planner who's going here to to develop his seed mix um, really doesn't have that in mind and and can't get the information needed to really flesh this out. Here's another place you might think this could be addressed. This is the NRCS state and transition models. And here is for a Wyoming sagebrush site with Blue Bunch and Thurber's needlegrass. And so in the state and transition models, we see what state a site might go to under different management or when different things happen to it. So for example, this site under um, improper grazing management with frequent fires can transition to the Sandberg bluegrass and annuals. And this is really as close as it gets to talking about succession. You know, here it says annuals and forbs um, and some rabbit brush. 
Um, again, you see annuals here, annuals here, but it's not giving a good detailed list that will help us in our planning. Um, and I think this is, you know, something that we could address. I think in the future, maybe we need to add more detail to these S and T models. So here's what I'm really proposing. Um, in this image here, we've got you know some kind of measure of cost per acre of these different um, strategies, and over here we've got similarity to site uh, climax community. So if we go up to the yellow box, this is kind of how I've uh, defined this. This is restoration strategy one, matching pre-disturbed species with local ecotypes. And just some notes here. The seed for this is likely not available. Um, you know, this is going to be like the Park Service model or, you know, it's a very small restoration where you can do um, local ecotypes. Often, if you're going to try to do this, you're going to have to contract grow these seeds um, to get enough seed for your for your um, restoration. And this gets very expensive. Restoration model two is a I think somebody might somebody? not be muted. I, I can't see who it is. Yeah, it's pretty garbled, so I don't think it's a question. I'm going to keep yeah. going. So restoration model two, and this is what we mostly see or use right now. So we're approximating the pre disturbed species with mostly non-local but adapted germplasms and cultivars. So, for example, if you've got a restoration planting in central Utah and one of your big components is blue bunch wheatgrass, you're more than likely going to be buying, you know, anatone or goldar are the cultivars which originated from Washington state. And they're adapted, they've been shown to be adapted through many, many years of testing, but they don't have local genetics and so there's there's some kind of there's some questions about their long term resilience. Um, and then if you go way down to the cheap section, we've got our reclamation or rehab mix here, and this is um, capturing the site and increasing forage. This would be your crested wheatgrass mix. Now my proposal over here is first a mixed cereal restoration mix, and this would be including all of the the plant types so shrubs grasses and forbs but also including as many different successional stages as you can and so it's not exactly you know it's not way up here as far as matching the pre disturbance community because it's not just the climax community we're shooting for we're shooting for a shotgun of all of the 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 communities. And so this is kind of imitating what would be in a in a long term seed bank. Another option I see is strictly early cereal seed mixes, and this would be like for um, emergency watershed protection sites where maybe an existing seed bank is already there in the ground, but you want to get some things to grow very quickly and stop erosion in that first year or two but you can allow the natural seed bank and plant community to, to restore itself after that. So these are my proposals. Um, and a couple other things I want to just talk about briefly. One of them is seeding rates. In Idaho and Utah NRCS, the current seeding rate recommendation is about 250 to 500 seeds per square meter if you're using a drill. And we often recommend doubling that for broadcast seeding. So in maximum, we're asking for about a thousand seeds per square meter. And then if you look in the literature, I found, you know, this example from Beckstead where they found 30,000 cheatgrass seeds per square meter in the seed bank. And so you've got to wonder if we're actually playing on an even field here. Or if the or if the weeds have a serious advantage over us. So the obvious question then is how did we arrive at these current seeding rates? And from what I can find in the literature is most of it came from the 50s and 60s. 
and had a lot to do with crested wheatgrass and productivity and cost. And so you'll see a lot of studies where they'll plant, like here we have 24 pounds, 12, 8, 4, and 2 pounds per acre of crested wheatgrass. Um, and then in the first year, you'll see a widespread of plants per square foot. Um, and obviously tracking exactly with what you would expect based on the number of seeds you put on the ground. And then by year two or year three, this all evens out to about the same thing. And so back then, obviously, um, why would you want to plant more seed if you were just going to get the same results, right? But what they weren't considering here is site resilience, and none of these studies occurred in the presence of heavy cheatgrass or other weeds. And so, you know, our problems again occur right here in that year one and year two range. So maybe it is worth our while to have um, this greater plant density in, in the initial establishment period. Oh, and I'll, I'll mention I did find in one of the, these old studies, they did talk about weed competition and they were actually removing native species that they considered weeds. Another thing we're looking at here at the PMC is what's going on underground in, in the natural plant communities. And so our question is, does adding soil biology from pristine sites benefit the native species and help with that plant succession and resilience? And so we're doing things like um, making um, probiotics using bioreactors and Johnson piles and, and you know, growing the soil biology, um, fungi and bacteria, and applying that to seeds or spraying that over our plantings um, after they're on the ground. And so we'll, we'll be learning more about this idea um, in, the, in the years to come. So what we really do again at the Plant Material Center is, is release development. And this just shows kind of the, that process. We go out on the landscape um, and we cover anywhere from Southern Washington down to the Colorado Plateau. We go to as many sites as we can find, whatever our target species are, bring those seeds back and do common garden studies and evaluations of, of different um, morphological metrics, plant height, that kind of thing, um, to decide which population might be best or worth making a release out of. And then we produce seed, get that to the commercial industry, and then it's available for you guys to use on the ground. So when we're talking about um, succession management, we need to kind of think, narrow this list down or, or at least develop a list of what species might apply here. And the best place I've found to to kind of make this list is the roadsides, um, because there's nothing in the literature that just, you know, has tables of species by successional stage. And so we've noticed this recurring plant community almost everywhere we go, where you'll see loads of cheat grass or ventnata or medusa head. They kind of um, distribute out across the landscape and then there's this plant community of natives um, you'll see gumweed uh, rabbit brush if you get away from the mowing you see that verbena um, oftentimes there's sand drop seed that you see here common sunflower um, if you get down into the pinion juniper areas um, multi-lobed groundsel is very common fiddle neck is common in a lot of areas and if you get down and in south in the southern half of Utah, you'll start seeing a lot of purple three on. So this is kind of our starting list of, of things we want to start investigating here at the PMC. And I'll just go through a couple slides highlighting what we've done with curly cup gumweed, and it'll tell you what we are either doing or planning to do with those other species as well. So gumweed, and this might be surprising to some species it, or some people, is a native. Um, it's a short-lived perennial. It fits that early to mid cereal realm. It's very adapted to disturbed sites. We find it pretty easy to establish, especially compared to some of our other forbs. 
Um, it's it flowers late in the summer, which was beneficial to some of our pollinator programs where we don't have a lot of uh, late flowering species uh, available right now. Pollinators love it. Um, it also serves as a, a seed source for um, small birds in the winter. And it has good seed production attributes. If you remember that earlier slide I showed like that slender flocks and talked about some of the other um, pioneers. A lot of those are just one or two inches tall and they just would never work in the seed production field. So we really like some of the attributes we're seeing in gum weed right now. Like I said, really excellent for pollinators. We've got records of 40 different genera of bees visiting this, um, plus several uh, groups of butterflies. And like I said, flowering late in the season when really the only other nectar and pollen sources might be rabbit brush or uh, sunflower. It's been found in sage grouse crops, so that's good for the wildlife people. And so here's our release strategy. We went out on the in our service area. Uh, I think we've got 25 different populations here. Um, goes all the way from Yellowstone National Park down to Moab, a little bit into Oregon and across the I-80 corridor of Nevada. And here we've got several uh, running north and south through Idaho and Utah. And it, you know, it would it might be nice to make a plant release for each one of these eco regions you see depicted on the map, but that wouldn't be sustainable economically in the in the in the seed industry. So what we'll ultimately do is evaluate the the genetics of all of these populations and look for meta populations or large natural groupings of genetics and combine representatives from each of those meta populations into a what we would call a pooled release. And we're getting near the end of this process, and so we should have a release, I hope, by the end of the year. Uh, like I mentioned, we, we bring all these seeds back and plant a common garden study. And we measured plant height, percentage of plants to flower in the first year. Remember, this is a, a biennial or short-lived perennial, so first year flowering is, is somewhat rare. And so if we can find one that flowers two years in a row instead of just one year before it terminates, then that would be good for seed production. Uh, we looked at winter survival flower production per plant. Uh, we looked at plant lodging as for a, um, a seed production attribute, flowering duration, uh, that's for the pollinators. And then in the lab, we measured seed mass and we measured root growth after 10 days. The idea being that um, plants that can get their roots going very quickly and down into the soil as quickly as possible are much less susceptible to drought and can survive that initial planting stage where you might only have short bursts of soil moisture. And then, you know, since this is a species no one has looked at or, or grown before or produced before, we have to seeding depth um, and then production and harvesting. So in this slide, I'm just showing kind of our, our protocol for evaluating the 10 day root growth. Um, we actually germinate the seed um, in oxygenated water baths. Um, this helps us bypass seed dormancy and also allows us to germinate things um, uniformly. So it's not germinating over a long, long spread of time. And then we, we um, can pull the little seedlings out and digitize them and measure the roots this way. And here's some some shots of our seed production um, evaluations. And so now we're to the point where we're doing field trials of this succession management concept. Um, so we've got three different sites here in southeast Idaho, one on our farm in Aberdeen, one about 25 miles north of us in the BLM desert, and then one on the Curlew National Grassland to the south of us. We're looking at 
um, early, late, and combined serial mixes. And we're doing these in the standard NRCS seeding rate, a 5X rate, and a 10X rate to see if that um, helps compete against weeds. And then we're looking at those soil probiotics versus a control. This shows our, our test sites. Here's the, the Aberdeen farm. Um, Coffee Point again is out in the desert. And then the Curlew test site is in the national grassland. It's a um, slightly higher pre-conditions for the initial evaluations. And I know this is busy, um, and I'll, I'll go through this really quickly. So up here we've got our late cereal, or what I would call our standard seed mix. And this is actually, you know, we'd be pretty happy to see this mix get planted. Um, we've got three pretty common late cereal forbs. This is yarrow, uh, globe mallow, and flax. Three grasses, blue bunch, sandberg, and thick spike wheatgrass and then sagebrush. And these are all put in um, just divided evenly to a percent of the mix. So divided, you know, 100 by 7, you come up with about 14 percent. And just standard NRCS rate across the board here. Then here's our early cereal mix. This has gumweed, tansiaster, fiddleneck, sunflower, bottle brush squirrel tail, sand drop seed, purple three on, and rubber rabbit brush. And then our combined mix is all of the above. And so we've got those at the standard rate, um, a 5X rate and a 10X rate, and we planted all three sites this past fall. So we are still in kind of the, the learning and initial stages of this idea, even though there's some good data backing up the idea. And here's some common um, concerns or questions that come up. So number one, will early cereal natives migrate outside of the restoration site and degrade the communities where they're not wanted? And I think we can answer this question right off the bat and just say no. The, the rotoral or early cereal natives are evolved to enter into a disturbed site and we really never see these going into a site that hasn't been damaged or disturbed in some way. Um, you know, if you're driving along the highway and you see one of those gumweed and sunflower sites, I mean, just look a few meters beyond that and see where that transitions back into either a native site or like a crested wheatgrass site. It just, you know, these things are not invasive at all. They're just colonizers, really. And then number two, will the addition of early cereal native species facilitate a transition to the desired plant community, or will they hinder successional processes and the ultimate climax species composition? And I think this is still a, a valid question. You know, it is possible that if we add a significant component of early cereal colonizer, colonizers, they might establish so well in our restoration site that the, the late cereal group that we're hoping for just never gets established, that that is possible. Um, it's also possible that these things just don't perform like we think they will, and it could be a waste of money and effort. So we hope to answer those questions over the next uh, few years. So in summary, here's our take home. Number one, don't confuse ruteral with invasive. Um, I think it would be really interesting for people to go through their copy of Weeds of the West and um, you know, have the plants database open at the same time and just see what of those species are native and which are introduced. Uh, I did that and it was very surprising and enlightening. So yeah, rotoral natives are not the same as invasive weeds, and I don't think we should treat them like they are. I think we need to incorporate succession management into our restoration plans and mixes. Um, I think there's enough data now to get us to start this process. I don't think there's any reason to, to, to really wait. We do need to increase the availability 
of both species and quantities of early cereal natives. And I would say demand creates supply here. If you practitioners on the ground are calling the seed companies and saying, I want gumweed seed for my mix, or I want sand drop seed, um, that's where it starts. They may they might not have it right now, but if they get enough requests, that, that's going to drive them to start putting in fields um, once they know it's economical, once they know they're going to make some money at it. We do need field species blends and ratios, which we're starting now, and we're gathering partners at universities to assist with that. And we need long term evaluations to observe real time succession. Um, this has been one of the problems in the past where the the grad school, you know, two year or four year cycle has really kind of hindered this process. And the plant materials program is a really good opportunity to to keep these trials in the ground for much longer periods of time. So that's going to be good. And I hope, you know, maybe if I've done my job here, there's been a change in perspective for some of you. You know, maybe this summer when you see this plant community, instead of saying, oh my gosh, that what a weedy mess that is, you'll see that this is, you know, a few good, valuable natives fighting against cheatgrass and doing a dang good job of it and providing ecosystem function here. You know, other if, if it weren't for these, Natives like um, gumweed and sunflower, what value would there be to pollinators and native wildlife? And finally, what we've done is uh, created a tech note, tech note 79, which is basically. More information and it's quite lengthy, so Greg had me produce a fact sheet um, that you see on the right succession management, and that's just a two pager for those that kind of want to get their feet wet or get the just the. The bare bones uh, first blush at this concept, or maybe that's something we can hand out to landowners or other partners. Those are available um, at we've got two websites, one through the National Plant Materials Program and one through Idaho NRCS. These are on both of those websites. And if you shoot me an email, I can just send you a copy. And that's me and my contact information. And I don't know what time it is, but hopefully we've got time for any discussion that uh, anyone wants to have. I'd be happy to beat this idea around. Anyone still there? Yeah, Derek, I've uh, I've got a question. Yeah, Derek, I've uh, got a question for you. Have yeah, you, you been bet. experimenting yeah, you with uh, yeah. cover crops at all? I've actually been diving into the literature quite a bit on seedings because I've got a project that I'm working on where I would like to seed a lot of native ruderal mixes, and um, I was wondering if you've tried cover crops at all, like a sterile wheat hybrid or uh, an annual uh, wheatgrass. Yeah, good question. And um, you know, for for a long time, people have been using the like sterile wheat or sterile triticale in this application, and I think that's a good idea. Um, the only problem I really have with that is I don't see those commercially available cover crops doing the same function underground. I think there's some some soil biology aspects that don't get addressed there. Um, but I do, you know, I have seen them successfully used where you can put in a nice cover crop mix and it'll help reduce weeds for a season. And then maybe you can, you know, no till into that residue for a fairly small project. So yeah, that's it's a good idea. I, I don't think it's quite as good as um, Succession management, but I see where you're coming from. Awesome. We've got a request uh, to drop the publications in the in the chat if you have a chance. OK. Yep, that might take me a minute, but I can do that for sure. Oh, Mary says she's got it. I've got a question for you. Um, yeah, go for it. 
So, so for for this uh, succession succession management, um, would would it be the kind of thing where you would have uh, just do the whole mix at once, or would you do the early seeding and then another seeding to get the later species, or would you just do the early seeding and let the the ecosystem around it introduce the seeds of the later seedings when appropriate? Yeah, good question. Um, I think the, the hope would be that you could do it all in one shot. Um, I think that's much easier and you know, if, if you were to do it separate, and I know sometimes we'll we'll do like seed grasses and get them established and then come in with forbs. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's it's it's something to to think about in the future. For now, I think we want to do it all in one seeding because what we don't want to do is establish a, a very competitive early cereal community and then have to like do site prep again, do some kind of chemical treatments to reduce that or do any more tillage on top of that so that we can establish the next group. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. And it looks like Mary's got those links put up or at least one of them. See that other question there, Derek? Is there any difference between the early successional species in northern and southern Idaho? Oh, great question. I'm sh there must be. Um, we don't spend a ton of time up north, um, but there's there's got to be some differences, and and we really do need to get a better grasp on what's in these different plant communities. And unfortunately, there's just really not the, the literature available at this point. I, 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 would, I would love to see more people do seed bank studies where you go out and get soil cores and propagate them in the greenhouse. Um, but yeah, bottom line is there, there's got to be some difference. And, you know, if you guys up north want to look at disturbed communities or you know, like on the roadsides, or if there's a fire, go in that first year after and see what comes up and, you know, start making a list or, and share it with the group. I think that'd be fantastic. And if you remember Derek's map of where the PMCs are across the country, we do have in northern Idaho, north Idaho, um, access to the Pullman Plant Materials Center, so uh, they can assist us as well. Yep, you bet. Now I will say when I've traveled up there to like the, you know, Spokane or the Tri Cities, if you're in that low precip zone that, you know, I guess down up there you you can get as low as about seven or eight inches. Of Most of the the plants I see are very similar, as, as at least in what we're working on. So I've seen fiddle neck and sunflower, um, and drop seed up there. Gumweed isn't really abundant as far as I can tell, but I'd, I'd love to get more information from you guys on the ground. Let's see, Cheryl says NRCS used to collect seeds for seed studies, just as out and about as requested by PMCs. Yes, very true. And back when field offices had a little bit more free time to leave their contracting alone for a minute that was a, a really valuable thing for the plant materials program is to send everyone out to get seed for us um, but after several years of requests and, and no return on it we kind of stopped appropriate to pull the field offices away from what they were doing but if you guys do have that kind of time and are interested in helping the plant materials program with seed collections let me know and we'll just make a network of collectors.
Any other questions? I don't see anything in the chat. I don't see any hands up. Yeah, not seeing it too much there. Um, we can, Derek, you know, you and I can certainly hang on till the top of the hour. Yeah, sounds good. Hey, thanks everybody uh, for attending. It looks like we've got, wow, 70 or so people. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, stay tuned and we'll we'll be sending out progress reports as this goes along. Um, yeah, I appreciate everyone coming. Thank you very much. Nice work, Derek. Thank you. Hey, Derek, I think that's a great idea. Let's start a seed collectors group in NRCS. How about it, Greg? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I think that uh, Derek hit the nail on the head, though. Where we have time, I think there are a lot of us who probably would have a good time doing that. I used to do it as a hobby for uh, trees anyway, but time gets uh, taken up with so many other things, not just contracting. Right, but it could be something, you know, You, I realize everybody's schedule is different, but just on the way to jobs, often we would identify places to go collect and spend 10, 15 minutes. So it just might be a good uh, morale booster. Yeah, yeah, something different. <laughs> thanks, you guys. It was great. Thanks, yeah, thanks, great. Cheryl. Yeah. And I'll add to that, um, you know, if, even if you guys like just drop the coordinates of a nice plant community of something we're looking at. That helps a lot. That's a great idea. Yeah. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Cheryl. Your uh, comments and thoughts are always appreciated. Greg, do you have any notion of like the ratio of NRCS to partners that might have been on? Uh, we could take a look at that, but just uh, guessing, um, I'd say at least a third. We maxed out around 80 or so. Um, I'd say at least a third were external. And we can go back and look at the attendance, actually. It's not a problem. Very cool. Yeah, yeah, nice work. That that was good. Um, uh, keeping folks updated on this and the opportunities is uh, something we can we can keep doing. Okay, well, it seems like everyone who's still on the line probably just fell asleep, so I'm gonna go ahead and drop off. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. I'm gonna stop the recording and do the same. Okay, thanks, Greg. Thanks Appreciate again. It. Yeah, I'll catch up with you later. Bye.